All right. Hello, welcome. We're just gonna wait for a few more people to join. Awesome. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Michaela and I will be monitoring the chat during our time together. Today, Oleg will be giving an introduction to Stefan Rook. Um, he is CTO at Kubler and has spoken at many conferences and this is the many of other webinars that we have done. If you have any questions during the webinar, please post them in the chat and Oleg will make sure to address them at the end. Okay, Oleg, let's go ahead and get started. Great, Michaela, yeah, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you everyone who joined uh, for participating and uh, listening to our webinars. <clears throat> um, just, just as Michael said, I'm CTO at Kubler. Uh, uh, we are building a product called Kubler, which uh, uh, enables you to manage multiple Kubernetes clusters across uh, various environments and uh, uh, multiple clouds, data centers from one control plane with a single uh, entry point for both operation teams, developer teams, uh, and Kubernetes end users uh, with centralized log collection, monitoring, identity management, air gap support, audit, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and as uh, developers of such a tool, uh, what we often see is that Kubernetes adoption is, uh, um, well, the first and probably often the biggest problem uh, challenge that people face when uh, they're thinking about using Kubernetes uh, is, of course, uh, the right set of tools to manage them at scale. Uh, but uh, the second uh, sort of line of problems and challenges uh, relates to actually using Kubernetes when it's already there, when you deploy it. And uh, uh, so the learning curve uh, itself is uh, relatively steep for Kubernetes uh, and uh, figuring out architectural uh, questions. So how would you store data there? How would you do the cup and disaster recovery? So all those questions uh, are also rather challenging. And this is why we uh, do the series of webinars uh, that talk uh, various challenges uh, uh, that people and companies face uh, when they are uh, deploying cloud native architectures. And those webinars mostly not related or not specific to Kubler per se. So you could do, uh, you could repeat the same demo, you could do the same <clears throat> uh, deployment uh, uh, using other tools to manage your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, or deploy Kubernetes cluster using uh, cloud uh, vendor, pro cloud vendors, uh, managed Kubernetes like EKS, AKS, for example, or using your own self-managed Kubernetes clusters. So, uh, and this today's webinar is uh, focusing on, uh, generally speaking, cloud native storage. Uh, what can you, what you can do uh, in terms of, uh, uh, data storage when you are uh, deploying cloud native architectures in the cloud and specifically on uh, one great tool uh, that uh, is often used for that, uh, Ceph and Rook combination. So Ceph uh, in itself is uh, a uh, storage system, open source storage system that is currently uh, maintained uh, by Red Hat mostly, <clears throat> uh, but it's, it's completely open source. It's very mature and reliable. is used in a number of uh, uh, real life applications, uh, including very high uh, scale uh, deployments. Um, Rook uh, is a Ceph operator that uh, allows you to uh, more efficiently manage uh, Ceph uh, on uh, Kubernetes clusters. And uh, while I'm showing this slide, uh, seemingly unrelated to what I'm talking about, uh, this slide uh, focuses on 
hybrid architectures applications on of of uh, uh, Kubernetes, and uh, so to make today demo and uh, uh, architecture discussion more interesting. So what 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 we decided to do is to uh, show how uh, this very 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 mature uh, cloud native storage solution can be used in rather complex uh, setup where you deploy several Kubernetes clusters across uh, multiple clouds. In our demo, we will deploy uh, it in uh, AWS and in Azure, and how it can be used to uh, replicate data across those clouds and provide uh, cloud native storage capabilities within those Kubernetes clusters for uh, applications running in those clusters. Uh, another interesting aspect of, of, of the demo today is that uh, we will run Ceph and, uh, and Rook, the, the storage system, uh, right on top of Kubernetes. So we, we are not going to deploy it separately. You will not have to deploy it separately. So uh, you, we will deploy uh, Rook and Ceph uh, right into those Kubernetes clusters. And uh, my goal and uh, a hope is to show you how Kubernetes simplifies and make it much more feasible to uh, deploy and manage even complex systems uh, in, in production, uh, even such complex uh, architecture that include managed, or not managed, but self-managed, self so to say, uh, storage systems. And uh, before we go there, uh, um, just uh, to uh, expand on, on this idea of using Kubernetes as your, uh, as more than just your container management system. So this is uh, what we are trying to promote as much as possible. So uh, usually when you start your Kubernetes journey, uh, you look at Kubernetes as, uh, as, as a container management system. So you think, hey, I have my application, it's containerized, uh, I want to deploy it somewhere, and Kubernetes is the best place for that. Now, uh, this is totally okay, this is completely okay, and uh, this is uh, what Kubernetes is built for, but uh, uh, when your use case uh, becomes more complex and grows in uh, scope, uh, you will notice that there are some questions that this narrowish view of Kubernetes uh, doesn't answer. <clears throat> so, uh, and what we promote uh, is a look at Kubernetes as an infrastructure uh, abstraction and your platform for your middleware uh, software. Uh, and by that, what I mean is, well, we're already talking about multi-cloud. So uh, we have our Kubernetes clusters running in AWS and Azure, for example. Uh, now, suddenly, uh, we, instead of working with uh, AWS and Azure directly, uh, your developers, your operations teams can focus on uh, working with Kubernetes clusters, maybe with some uh, minor uh, differences uh, between those clouds related to uh, some cloud primitives like storage or ingress management. Uh, but most importantly, for, for you, for your development teams and for your operations teams, uh, Kubernetes suddenly becomes this uh, ab 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 abstracted infrastructure. Uh, layer. And uh, if you can view it like that, uh, you can become much more productive when you're planning uh, a uh, hybrid deployment or multi-cloud deployment. And another consideration that follows from uh, this first one is now uh, looking at your Kubernetes as an infrastructure platform. Mm -hmm. You can also think about deploying so-called middleware. And by middleware, uh, I, I mean uh, software which is not uh, specifically 
written for uh, a specific business requirement uh, in your uh, organization, but provides some generic services to your business applications, like storage system based on Ceph, Rook, or Portworks, or database, cloud native database based on VTS, MySQL, Postgres, whatever. Messaging system like Kafka, uh, CDR uh, system, and uh, we can use Valera there. So as it happens, uh, Kubernetes can be a great platform for uh, components like that, uh, not only providing this functionality, but making this functionality portable. Now, again, suddenly you can use a Ceph as your storage system, and this storage system will work uh, exactly the same uh, on AWS and on Azure. And more importantly, you can use the storage system to easily set up, uh, for example, data replication or data mirroring or BCDR across clouds and environments and data center. And now, at last, uh, we are following uh, uh, on our demo. So to show you all those capabilities and to show you how the stack can be deployed and uh, configured in uh, hybrid environments. So uh, we uh, created uh, this uh, uh, demo project on our GitHub account at uh, GitHub Kubler slash hybrid demo. <clears throat> and what, what I, I will do, I will just essentially go through this demo uh, step by step, uh, explaining on the way uh, what we are doing and uh, the architecture of some components we are deploying and provisioning. Uh, you can do the same, you can uh, follow this demo, or you can repeat this demo uh, in your own environment. Uh, um, uh, what, what, what it consists of, it, it consists of two Kubernetes clusters that uh, we deploy using Kubler on AWS and on Azure. And again, so you can use other tools, although some things will have to be adjusted when you, when you deploy those clusters using other tools. Uh, but some foundational things, not the whole demo, essentially some majority of the steps will stay the same. Uh, we deploy, we will connect those two clusters uh, securely using uh, Submariner. It's an open source tool for uh, VPN side to side connections, uh, very, very well suited for uh, hybrid and multi cloud deployments of Kubernetes <clears throat> with reliable uh, connectivity, failover, uh, load balancing, et cetera, et cetera, implemented uh, in the core tool. Uh, using these uh, interconnected clusters, uh, in each of these clusters, we deploy uh, Ceph storage system. Uh, and you will see that uh, not only they serve as a uh, cloud native storage tools, uh, they also uh, provide value add on top of uh, infrastructure level storage. So in AWS, clearly Ceph will use uh, EBS, disks as raw storage. On Azure, it will use uh, Azure disks as raw storage. Uh, uh, but so because uh, Ceph uh, combines them into data pools, allows you intra-cluster uh, replication and uh, um, various other uh, functionality like load balancing between different zones, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it will also make it possible to uh, avoid some of the uh, pitfalls uh, related to uh, native infrastructure related storage. Like for example, EBS disks and uh, Azure disks are zoned. So each disk is pinned to the zone in which it was uh, created. Uh, and Ceph will replicate data across zones uh, uh, so that losing any of your zones will not affect your applications using that data in any way or form. Uh, okay, I won't uh, focus on uh, these following slide slides much. So let me uh, start with the demo first. Uh, and while some of the uh, long running steps are going through, I will get back to demo and talk about architecture, various components. Uh, 
So we start here with uh, some prerequisites. Uh, and uh, as I said, we are using Kubler for deployment and you will also need some uh, command line tools for these commands to work. And the first thing we do is uh, we deploy two Kubernetes clusters. Um, and in my case, I already did that because deploying a cluster is uh, sort of a longish procedure. Uh, takes 10, 15 minutes <clears throat> for all the components to come together and the cluster to become green. Uh, in our demo, we uh, included two cluster specifications. Uh, as you can see them here, cluster specification uh, for AWS cluster and uh, cluster specification for Azure cluster. So you can just use those uh, cluster specs uh, with Kubler to, uh, when you create a cluster, you can just paste this cluster spec into uh, custom specification window, or you can use Kubler API and submit those uh, cluster specs and uh, your clusters will be up and running in a few minutes. So, uh, you will need to wait until all the components are deployed, uh, including additional packages. I will talk about that in a few minutes. And then uh, you, need, you will need to uh, uh, download uh, cube config files for those clusters and uh, set them up in your command line uh, console. So again, I already did that. So we can check that our clusters are up and running. So here we'll just run uh, get nodes, Kubecat will get nodes command uh, for each of those clusters. And yes, indeed, we see these are nodes from our AWS cluster and these are Azure cluster nodes. Um, we did, uh, uh, we included uh, some of the packages that need to be deployed uh, in those clusters uh, into the cluster specs directly. And to show that, let me uh, quickly open, uh, for example, AWS cluster specification. I'll scroll down to uh, packages section here. <clears throat> so packages section in Kubler cluster specification allows you to add certain uh, additional, or not certain, but any additional Helm packages. And here I include Submariner uh, and uh, several packages related to Ceph setup and configuration. Uh, so uh, essentially this means that after the cluster is up, you also have uh, Ceph uh, up and running there and everything ready to connect those clusters using uh, Submariner. And we can check it by running uh, this command. So this command uh, will, uh, will essentially use kubectl to uh, query the cluster and print a connection information for those self clusters uh, deployed into those Kubernetes clusters. I already opened uh, those self clusters UI, and you can see that uh, we have our self clusters running. This guy is on AWS, uh, this one is on Azure. Each of them has already a number of components configured, including a, uh, a full storage pool for block devices, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, our next steps in the demo would be to connect uh, these two clusters uh, with Submariner VPN. And for that, uh, so this section talks about setting up Submariner uh, uh, command line tool. Uh, I already have it set up in my, um, uh, in my terminal. Uh, this section, uh, just configure some environment variables that contain values of shared keys and secrets that uh, we will need to connect those two clusters. Uh, now, uh, the next step is joining uh, sort of uh, a AWS cluster. In the next section will join uh, Azure cluster. Uh, so after both are joined, they'll try to connect and uh, we'll watch how it happens. <clears throat> so joining AWS cluster and you will notice that uh, the only uh, command of essence here, so here we just 
configure a few environment variables, and then we just uh, install a Submariner operator uh, Helm package into our cluster. And the same happens when we uh, join uh, or add uh, Azure cluster to our setup. And uh, as soon as we deploy the Submariner operator there, uh, we can use Submariner command line tool to see the status of the connection. As you can see right now, uh, it's not yet connected. So uh, they, those two clusters need to find each other. It will take maybe a minute or so. So while they are at it, at this task, <clears throat> uh, just to quickly review what Submariner is. So Submariner uh, installs in a Kubernetes cluster. <clears throat> it sets up a routing agent on every cluster node. Uh, it also sets up uh, gateway components on some nodes that you indicated as gateway nodes. So those which have uh, essentially external connectivity so that uh, Submariner can uh, set up a VPN between those nodes. Uh, and then uh, when two clusters are properly configured to find to be able to find each other, Submariner sets up uh, uh, VPN connection, site-to-site -site VPN connection between uh, uh, active gateway nodes. And then it watches changes in the clusters, it watches new connections, so you can use uh, hub-spoke uh, architecture, so for example, to connect more than two clusters into a single VPN. Mm. Uh, and Submariner uh, dynamically updates all those routes, uh, switches to a passive gateway node is if active goes down for any reason. So essentially it keeps those two clusters connected. Now let's see if we, yeah, uh, our uh, next run of Submariner uh, status, we can see that uh, we have a connection established between those two clusters. Uh, we can quickly check that uh, those clusters are indeed connected. So this command uh, will run test pods uh, in both uh, clusters. And uh, we will use these test pods to test connectivity between those clusters. So let, let's wait while those pods are getting up and running. So you see they are uh, container uh, containers are being created for those pods <clears throat> in the first cluster and in the second cluster. We run these pods on every node using daemon set to be able to test connectivity between all the nodes. <clears throat> so while they are starting, let me get back to this picture. So uh, our next step will be uh, setting up Rook and Ceph. But before going there, let me uh, finish with testing our connectivity. So we can see that uh, we have now all our test pods running. And uh, let's run a script which essentially tests connections from each pod to each other pod, uh, including uh, so it tests uh, both connections within the cluster and between the clusters, as you can see, from AWS cluster to AZ cluster, Azure cluster, uh, all connections from each pod to each other pod works. Mm -hmm. Notably, uh, Submariner uh, not only allows you to connect uh, pods on IP level, you know that every pod has its own IP within the cluster, and uh, uh, they clearly can talk between each other using those IPs, uh, but service discovery is also important. So we need to verify that uh, services from one cluster can be accessed from another clusters. And uh, the second script does exactly that. So it runs uh, a command curl, essentially test command from each pod in each cluster to a certain service in again, each cluster. And here we can see that every pod in every cluster can connect to services uh, in, 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 in both its own cluster and the other cluster. So we have our uh, VPN uh, verified. So and the next steps are 
related to uh, uh, we'll play with uh, Ceph and Druk as our storage providers. Uh, but before going there, uh, we will test a number of uh, very interesting capabilities, including uh, mirroring, data mirroring. Uh, and uh, because we have just uh, created those clusters and we have just connected them in terms of networking, uh, we don't yet have uh, our CEF clusters running in these uh, Kubernetes clusters uh, connected so that mirroring can work. So uh, let me do that first, and then we can switch to discussing CEF architecture and various uh, capabilities that it allows, uh, makes available to your cloud native application. So uh, setting up mirroring uh, between those two storage clusters uh, starts with uh, marking uh, the, our uh, block pool uh, uh, as uh, setting, setting it up for mirroring, essentially marking that we want it to be mirrored in image mode. Image mode means that this pool uh, does not automatically mirrors every image created inside of that pool. It is ready to mirror images, but it will wait for administrator command uh, for specific images to start uh, mirroring them. So we'll run and you will notice that those are kubectl command. Those are not a command line tool for Ceph. Uh, and I'll explain why in, in a few minutes. <clears throat> so we patched uh, configuration of this Ceph block pool, I marked it for mirroring, and uh, uh, we can see now that in our Ceph UI, uh, we have a warning, which oh, first we had an error, which then switched to warning, uh, and this warning will go away in a few minutes, uh, uh, which means that Ceph is actively at work. Uh, uh, ready to start mirroring this block pool. It's, it's just that we need to also provide certain uh, security parameters, uh, shared keys, and exchange or let uh, our CEF clusters exchange those keys so that they can safely and securely uh, uh, send data across clusters. That again is done by running uh, kubectl. Uh, commands and what happens in these commands. Uh, so it first uh, reads from each cluster uh, secrets uh, provided by itself uh, and then uh, mutually shares those secrets to other Ceph clusters. Uh, and as a last step, it creates so called volume replication class. Uh, a uh, Kubernetes object that is used uh, to uh, tell Ceph that a certain volume, which means image essentially in terms of uh, Ceph, uh, should be replicated. And we can check uh, the status of, of this mirroring by again running kubectl command. We can see that uh, for now it's still in the warning status, uh, but it will soon change and it already changed here uh, in the Ceph UI. So we can see that our pools are correctly and healthy in the uh, mirror view of our Ceph cluster. Uh, and then uh, at this time, at this moment, we are ready to start playing with actual applications. <clears throat> uh, but before going there, uh, let's talk about what Ceph is and uh, how it works and what it gives you in Kubernetes. So Ceph itself, as I uh, mentioned before already, is a general purpose storage system. So it wasn't designed specifically for Kubernetes. So it can run on uh, virtual machines, on physical machines, wherever it can be installed as a set of uh, RPM packages. Its main components are monitors, so this is essentially brain of your Ceph cluster. Uh, they keep all the metadata, meta information, and configuration information. <clears throat> OSD components are responsible for data storage. So they communicate with raw storage 
uh, block devices usually uh, and can run on, 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 the, on multiple nodes. They all talk to monitor, monitors to get their configurations, to, to report their status, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so at this level, uh, the only entity Ceph provides and introduces is uh, uh, data pools. So a number of OSDs uh, provide raw storage for data pools, and you can configure uh, uh, multiple data pools with different characteristics. So one data pool may be, for example, uh, set up with replication, with ECC error code correction, with encryption. Another data pool may be set up with uh, less redundancy. Maybe you are using it for non-critical data. Uh, third data pool may be uh, dedicated to certain higher level uh, iterations or functions of CF. Uh, uh, but whatever it is, uh, uh, data pool is uh, the most basic uh, entity in, in your CEF cluster. Within data pool, you can create so-called images. And image is an abstract uh, block device, essentially. So it always has a specific size. Uh, it is... Uh, uh, under the hood, Ceph presents it as a set of pages distributed between different OSDs according to uh, the configuration of the data pool and the image. And it provides it to the outside world, to the application as a block device connected, which can be uh, attached using RBD uh, protocol. Now, on top of data pools, Ceph builds uh, a number of higher level functions, like Ceph file system, for example. It's a uh, shared distributed file system uh, that uh, is not unlike NFS, but provides sort of more functionality. You can use uh, snapshotting, uh, you can do replication using the Ceph file system. Uh, but the main difference from uh, data pool images is that it's a distributed file system. When you mount it, when you attach it, you get a file system rather than a block device. <clears throat> and uh, MDS components are responsible. MDS CEF components are responsible for essentially this uh, CEF file system functionality. Uh, but under the hood, CEF file system is using data pool for raw storage, essentially. So you will find in, in, in CEF UI, if you look at uh, pools, we will see several pools uh, like Ceph file system data zero, Ceph file system metadata. Those are exactly data pools used by those MDS components to provide file system. Uh, similarly, uh, RGW component provides object store, again, backed by data pools. Uh, Ganesha components uh, provide NFS uh, backed by Ceph file system. Uh, MGR component uh, allow you to deploy, enable, use various plugins for Ceph. RDB, RBD mirror components allow you to, or actually they are responsible for mirroring certain data pools between clusters, or yeah, between clusters. Uh, now, this is Ceph per se. Uh, we also mentioned Rook in the title of this uh, webinar. And Rook is essentially a Kubernetes operator that makes it possible to easily deploy Ceph in a Kubernetes cluster and uh, manage uh, Ceph cluster using Kubernetes facilities. So uh, when you deploy uh, Ceph through Rook, you immediately get ability to uh, provision uh, block devices using standard Kubernetes provisioning architecture using persistent volume claims, persistent volumes, etc. Uh, same with uh, Ceph file system. You can use persistent volumes to provision uh, volumes backed by Ceph file system. Uh, similarly, uh, you can use uh, Kubernetes facilities uh, for volume snapshotting, for volume uh, cloning, for volume replication, mirroring, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll work 
through uh, our demo uh, to show some of these capabilities at least. Hmm. Uh, the last uh, element of uh, our discussion is uh, essentially how we define this stack. I already uh, briefly mentioned that uh, our cluster uh, is fully described by uh, this uh, Kubernetes, uh, Kubler, uh, Kubernetes cluster spec, which includes a lot of uh, information about how this cluster needs to be set up. Uh, what's important to understand is that uh, we can separate this specification to several sections, uh, each of which is responsible for various different levels of configuration. Like there are sections related to uh, infrastructure specific configuration. And these sections are uh, uh, the main difference between our Azure and AWS clusters. Like for example, in Azure cluster, we specify additional ports that need to be opened for VPN using uh, AWS security groups. In Azure cluster, we use Azure security groups and Azure specific format for those. Uh, similarly, uh, each uh, node group in our cluster is uh, set up using spot instances in corresponding cloud to reduce cost. Uh, and using different availability zones, uh, but clearly it's a little bit different format for uh, AWS and for Azure Cloud. Other sections are responsible for higher level concepts like network section, for example, uh, sets up a network configuration, uh, Kubernetes network configuration, and uh, it has the same structure in both clusters, but a little bit different parameters because we want to use non-intersecting CIDRs for pods and services in those clusters so that we can connect them using VPN. And so this is uh, the cluster definition. And we also have uh, additional packages installed in those clusters out of the box, just as I said, uh, some certain objects uh, related to Submariner uh, for VPN connection. And uh, Rook and Ceph are essentially included into this cluster specification. So when we bring those clusters up, we immediately get root and safe clusters running in, in, in our Kubernetes clusters. So now let's uh, test some of the safe capabilities. And I'll start with data mirroring uh, as the most probably advanced and complex concept here. So let's deploy a test application. And here I'm using kubectl uh, with uh, inline definition of uh, Kubernetes objects that I'm deploying. And you will notice that uh, this definition includes two objects. Uh, the first one is essentially a persistent volume claim. It's a request from an application to Kubernetes to provision a uh, persistent volume. And we are asking to provision a persistent volume using Ceph block storage class. So storage class is a Kubernetes concept that allows you to have multiple types of storage in your cluster. And for example, in our demo, we have Ceph block storage class set up, Ceph file system uh, storage class set up. So depending on this storage class we specify here, uh, we will get different types of storage. And the second object is just a deployment which uh, creates single pod, which will use that block device <coughs> configured by Kubernetes uh, in Ceph. And it doesn't do anything except uh, printing in its log a content of a certain file. So uh, let's, let's deploy this application and see how it goes. So, and we deploy it in AWS cluster. Before going there, let's see if our uh, start of application. Oh, we're ready. Yeah, everything is okay. So our self clusters are indeed mirrored. So let's deploy our test application. 
and uh, let's see how it looks in uh, uh, AWS or Kubernetes dashboard, how it looks in the Ceph cluster. So first of all, we will notice that almost immediately after deployment, a new image was created in the block pool. Uh, and it has this strange name, automatically generated name. <clears throat> uh, if we go to Kubernetes uh, dashboard, uh, in our default namespace, we will see that here is our persistent volume claim created. And we will notice that a volume was automatically created for that persistent volume claim. Uh, and uh, in response to creating this volume, uh, let me find it here. So we can actually go right here, uh, see list of our persistent volume, we will see that this volume was created with set block storage class one minute ago. And it's exactly that in response to creating this volume in Kubernetes, our rook operator created this image in uh, Ceph and then connected it. And now this image is used by our application, uh, even, even if it just stores one file there. Uh, so this uh, is uh, this this uh, how it works on the Kubernetes level is shown on this slide. So we create a volume claim which is used as a volume inside the pod. Uh, volume claim refers to persistent volume and storage class and provisioner. In our case, it's Rook uh, uses persistent volume and storage class information to to, to provision an actual storage. So uh, let's uh, go through the rest of our uh, demo here. So uh, we can enable mirroring for this, for this volume by creating another Kubernetes volume of, of volume replication type. Now let's see how it works. So volume replication is created. And now if we check our UI in Ceph, we will notice that this image disappeared. So this is a little bit confusing yeah, in, in Ceph UI. So this image has not disappeared really. It, it moved to a different section. It moved to mirroring section. It's now visible here. As you can see, uh, we have this image uh, shown in the ready section of the mirroring uh, UI. And let's check other, uh, our other Ceph cluster. Uh, we don't see image here in our Azure cluster, but we will see it in the ready state uh, or in the ready UI, uh, in the ready tab of our mirroring UI. This image was just created when we enabled replication of that image and it was created with replaying status. So it means that this image cannot be yet used directly. You would have to manually switch it to primary status. Uh, but this is how replication for block devices works. So you cannot use that at the same time. Uh, uh, and that's it. So we can use uh, comma, uh, Kubernetes command line tool to check replication status. We can look into this object we have just created and its conditions show that this image is promoted, meaning that it's the primary. In, in, in our AWS cluster, it's syncing, it's syncing, it's healthy, everything is good. So uh, we can touch, change the data in this application running on our AWS cl cluster by putting some, uh, some data, hello world in this case, into this file it shows. And now we can check in its logs that we indeed put some content into, into this file. Mm -hmm. uh, switching to uh, a different uh, cluster uh, requires that this application is recreated in, in another cluster uh, as an inactive or passive uh, application. So uh, these four commands essentially use kubectl to copy uh, the de deployment uh, with zero replicas, the persistent volume claim, the volume replication object, um, uh, and, and, and the volume object uh, to another cluster. So let me do that. 
and we will notice that uh, in our Azure cluster, the application was created. We have the deployment here, but it wasn't started yet. It has zero replicas. Now imagine we want to switch to another uh, cluster. So uh, let's do that. So we need to demote this application in our AWS cluster, unless it was done for us by some disaster, for example. Uh, so we tell uh, that now we want to reduce number of instances in our AWS cluster and tell Ceph that this volume replication should be demoted to secondary or replay. And we can check it in uh, Ceph UI. Uh, so we will see that after refresh, uh, it's now not in a ready state, but in a state called unknown. This is because now we have two volumes that are connected for replication, but none of them is primary. So Ceph doesn't know what to do, what to replicate here. And uh, now we can promote it in the Azure cluster. We do the same here. We patch the volume, telling Ceph that it should now be the primary and uh, uh, scale up the application there. And we can check now, we don't see in I, our AWS cluster, the image became replaying and in our Azure cluster, we need to refresh it here. Oh, it became primary already. So, and I'm sure that our Azure application has already been scaled up. We indeed can see it here, it's running. And uh, we can check uh, the logs of that application. And we see that it does indeed see the data that we uh, introduced in our AWS cluster. So this uh, application was indeed replicated. So I don't want to go through the same steps switching back to AWS. I just want to quickly scan through uh, other capabilities that you can use uh, and other tests that you can do in uh, using this demo. Like for example, you can deploy an application that uses a different type of volume uh, CEF file system. So if you deploy it, uh, you will also see that uh, a new persistent volume, oh, let me see. I, I, by mistake, I created in, 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 in an Azure cluster actually. In our Azure cluster, we will see that uh, a new persistent volume of type uh, CFFS was created. Uh, and uh, unlike with block devices, we will see that a file system was actually created. Uh, and uh, within that CEF file system, uh, we can even uh, browse it and see that uh, a volume was created there as a sub tree in that CEF file system. So this is how CEF file system works. Uh, it essentially provides one gigantic uh, file tree. Uh, and uh, under that tree, you can create sub volume, which may have their own quotas, their own characteristics, and their own snapshots. So, and this is uh, exactly what happened here. So for each volume you create in Kubernetes, a sub volume will be created in Ceph. Uh, uh, we already saw how block images are consumed. We already deployed that application. Uh, but <clears throat> just in case, uh, uh, next steps of the demo uh, depend on that, we will create application like that. So uh, we can create snapshots. So both CFFS and block devices uh, support snapshots and they can be fully controlled uh, through Kubernetes objects using a Rook operator. Uh, but to do that, you will need to first create a snapshot class. And this is exactly what this command do. So, and as soon as you have a snapshot class, now you can create volume snapshots uh, referring 
that snapshot class and specific volume. So and by creating snapshot uh, object in uh, Kubernetes API, uh, you can see that it was created. Uh, let's refresh here. Yeah, here it is. So now it was created as a snapshot in uh, a um, in the tree, uh, in the file tree uh, in the CFFS in CF UI. Uh, similarly, uh, you can create snapshots uh, for RBD images for binary images. So when you create a Kubernetes snapshot class, and then you create a Kubernetes snapshot object for uh, log device back persistent volume uh, that snapshot will be immediately created uh, for the block device so we can check it here snapshots here it is uh, you can also have full access to uh, parameters of those snapshots and those volumes uh, through kubernetes objects etc etc so in terms of uh objects that you create uh, again you we we, we 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 can see it in abstract form on this diagram so when you create a snapshot uh it must refer to snapshot class mm, collecting all the generic parameters and then it refers to a persistent volume from which that snapshot is created um now, those snapshots can, of course, be used to create new persistent volumes. So uh, when you create a snapshot, you refer to a certain persistent volume. Uh, well, then uh, when you create a new persistent volume, you can refer to that snapshot as a baseline, in which case a new persistent volume will be created from that snapshot. And this is very convenient when you want to optimize uh, so one use case for that would be, for example, to optimize your build processes. Imagine that you have a you know, Java Maven based build where your builds rely on a Maven repository. So instead of letting Maven build a uh, local repository copy every time when you run the build, you can use this ability, uh, this uh, snapshot functionality to create and update that snapshot with a local uh, uh, Maven repository every day, for example, so that your builds run much faster when they have already pre-populated repository created from snapshot, which they can also modify by themselves too. Uh, now, creating a volume uh, or recovering a volume from snapshot is just creating a persistent volume claim uh, with a reference to a certain snapshot. We can try doing that uh, here. So we created a new persistent volume claim referring uh, to referring our snapshot uh, for CFFS, and similarly, the same would work for RPD. And uh, we can see here, so we, our volume claims were actually created and already activated. And we can see those images uh, uh, added in our block pool. Let me see. Our block image, uh, this is a copy. And uh, in one of them, I hope this is a copy. No, this is the original, which has the snapshot here. And uh, in, in, in the copy, we can see that it was created from parent, which is snapshot in our original image. Similarly, uh, you can create copy of a, pers uh, of a persistent volume directly from an existing persistent volume without using snapshot as an intermediary. And it, it looks very similar in terms of uh, Kubernetes objects, it's called volume cloning, and it is done by again creating a persistent volume claim uh, with a data source reference pointing at another persistent volume claim rather than a snapshot object. 
So, uh, and the same works for RBD volumes. Okay, this is a very brief and uh, quick mm. overview, uh, which didn't touch uh, questions like NFS, object store, uh, BCDR, Vilera, for example, BCDR with uh, Kubernetes tools like Vilera, uh, various uh, more advanced uh, functionality that Ceph provides like quotas, topology customization, uh, resource customization, etc., etc. Uh, but we included a few uh, links here that can be used to dig deeper uh, if you want to learn more about that. And of course, uh, feel free to ask questions now or later. Uh, we published this uh, video, we will publish this video and this uh, presentation is also published with all the coordinates and uh, links. Now we are open to questions, I think. So we do have one question, Oleg, um, a few questions, I'm sorry. The first one is, can S3 object be replaced with any other job object store, for example, Minio? Yes and no, depends on your specific architecture, of course. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, uh, you're exactly right. Minio is a great uh, standalone object store. Uh, you can even run it in uh, Kubernetes and uh, use it as a replacement for S3 storage, as long as you uh, are ready for a little bit more complex configuration. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's fully compatible with S3 API, so you can even use uh, S3 client, uh, S3 AWS client libraries to work with Minio, uh, but you will have to specify additional uh, endpoints for that service. And uh, this question is very relevant actually to uh, our uh, presentation as well, because one of the uh, components of uh, Rook or uh, Ceph is actually this S3 Swift object store. Implement, uh, implemented with uh, RGW components of Ceph. So this uh, is mostly used, the main use case here is to use it as an object store in OpenStack environments, but it can be used as a standalone uh, S3 compatible object store as well as another alternative to Minio or S3. How often do you see people using multiple clusters? Almost always, I would say, because uh, when you start playing with Kubernetes, uh, you, of course, will run one cluster, uh, which is probably designated as your development cluster. Uh, when you deploy in production, you will most probably need at least one other, uh, because it's not a good practice to combine critical slash production environment and non-critical call it DF environments. So it's better to separate them as much as possible, which means a separate cluster. You can also, you will also see that you will probably need another cluster for staging, testing to verify your changes before going to production. Maybe even separate cluster for QA, and maybe at some point, or well, probably at some point, you uh, will have a mature uh, process that requires setting up temporary clusters for your automated testing, uh, which tools like Kubler make uh, possible and easy. And then one last question, Oleg, for the sake of time, um, in about one minute, can you just explain how would you address backup and disaster recovery with Ceph on Kubernetes? Um, Yes, yeah, so there are great tools uh, like Vilera BCDR tool, uh, so which is general purpose BCDR tool for Kubernetes. And it works great with uh, Rook and Ceph exactly because uh, both use standard Kubernetes uh, concept like volume snapshot, for example, and, uh, uh, and uh, cloning. So Vilera can work both on top of Ceph using Ceph uh, uh, management capabilities, as well as under Ceph, so to say, using, uh, uh, backing up the whole Ceph cluster. Uh, 
Actually, we have one more question in the Q and A section. Uh, so it's great for AMI rehydration. Can SEF do real time replication? Uh, again, yes and no. Uh, neither uh, block devices replication nor SEF file system replication is really real time. So they require certain actions to recover uh, the passive uh, passive instance. It's it's more pronounced for block devices. <clears throat> for SEF file system, uh, uh, it's easier to do. So you can do uh, active slash warm setup with SEF file system, but it has its own uh, drawbacks a little bit. So if you want to have completely active active system, you, you need to make it a part of your application architecture because uh, a lot uh, depends on the characteristics that you need to achieve in this active active setup. So latencies, how, how, how much acceleration do you have to latencies and uh, what kind of atomicity you need from your transactions across environments, etc., etc. So it cannot be done just on the level of data storage. Well, that is all the time we have for today. Thank you all for joining today's webinar. Please feel free to reach out with any questions or topic suggestions, and we'll be sure to get back to you. And we hope that you can join us next time for our upcoming webinar um, that will be coming shortly. Be sure to follow our social media on LinkedIn and Twitter. We are always updating everyone on there with upcoming webinars and any news um, information that comes out. So again, thank you. And thank you, Oleg, for a wonderful webinar. Thank you for joining us. The great questions. Mm -hmm.